this is a bit of a specialized technique. Obviously, all of you are not going to use this, but just to give you an appreciation of it, and I'm going to give you a brief history of it as well, because I think that the, the development of this is quite interesting as well. Um, and it was a long, I think, painful process to that. Um, obviously, if you're doing any kind of breeding stock improvement, you need some method to control the mating, whether that's isol uh, drone saturation, isolated mating stations, whatever. But um, this gives a, this technique gives us complete control of the mating process of honeybees. Um, as you're very aware, the multiple mating we talked about quite a bit. But it is really an essential tool for both research, if you're trying to do specific crosses um, to evaluate different traits, things like that, and also for breeding purposes. Um, and there's major advantages. You can do things that don't occur in nature with this technique. It's pretty amazing. You can, you can take um, mix semen from many, many drones and give the queen a complement of that. For example, like if you mix like 100 different drones and give her a subset sampling of that. So essentially, she's mated with this huge number of drones. You can go to the other extreme and do a single drone insemination. Say you're trying to pull out a, a, a specific trait that's not very common in the population. You can do things as extreme as taking one drone um, the semen of one drone and mating that to like four different queens. I mean, that's a really small amount. She won't lay very long, but it's, it's just another tool. Um, we can hold semen for uh, two weeks, about 10 days, two weeks. And the ability to store that, it, it, you can move it different places, um, easy transport with, with less risk of diseases, which is a good, um, gives a lot of value. You can create varying degrees of inbreeding um, more for research purposes. And also, we now have the ability to acquire or preserve honeybee semen, which really gives us a lot of possibilities for future selection, conservation of different types of subspecies, um, and just has a lot of value in that. So, um, of the 28 recognized subspecies across the world, in the U.S., we, we imported just a small subset of these. And I think this really led to, um, this is the Honeybee Act of 1922, honeybee importation was restricted, and restricted into the U.S. So you have a small subset. And early on, we brought in the uh, Mellifera mellifera. And, it, it, and then later on, um, this was introduced in the 1600s, later in the early 1800s, mid-1800s, we brought in um, the Italian bees, and these were very much favored. They're, they're more gentle, pretty color, and the beekeepers said that these had kind of run out. They were open mating with mellifera mellifera and kind of a mix of those two, so they really wanted a method to control the mating. That was a big uh, desire, a big push for that. Um, they were ads in the bee journals offering pure stocks, or there were rewards offer. Anyone who could make queens in confinement, um, there were advertisements for places as, as large as a greenhouse or these huge tents, to descriptions of a little powder box with a uh, drone caressing the virgin queen in the box. Really cute little things like that back in the literature, if you look at that. But the desire to control how they mate. This is one of the... Um, early tents. This is from 1901, 1906. They built this big tent, hoping to mate the queens and the drones inside here. And they have these little mating nooks where the, the, be the worker bees can fly on the outside, but the queens and the drones could only fly on the inside. And of course, that was not very successful. And lots of rewards offered for this, but nobody collected the rewards. So this is a... Uh, rotating mating cage. They thought, oh, well, they, they're mating in flight, so maybe you put them in this rotating uh, mating cage, and, and there's a mirror on the top here, so you get some nice sunlight in there. But of course, that was not very successful. So you can see the desire for this w was really strong. It, was, it wasn't until 1926 that um, Lloyd Watson demonstrated the first successful technique. So what he had was, um, he was a glass blower. He hand blew these um, glass syringes in which he collected a little bit of semen. And the queen was 
um, put on a little wooden platform with a silk thread, tied on there with a silk thread, and then he would attempt to inject the semen. There was other experiments with hand mating, simply holding a drone and a, a virgin queen and trying to avert the drone's endophallus into the queen uh, with not too much success. Um, he also coined the term instrumental insemination. You see, like, and there's, it's used pretty much interchangeably with artificial insemination, but this is where the term came from originally. So um, he had some partial success in this. Early on, they didn't really realize how many times queen mates, and there was a lot of speculation, maybe she mates with only one drone. Um, it wasn't until about the 40s that we really discovered that queens are multi mating with many drones. So this is, uh, this is Watson's insemination device. Here's his glass-blown syringe, um, his little wooden bed with the silk threads. I don't know if you can see that there, but it says $32, $33. If you look at that compared to what the instruments are selling for today, of course, we're a little more sophisticated. But um, yeah, that's what he had. So the early trials of this are, are interesting. It, um, it would take them a really long time to try to get some semen into the, uh, the oviducts of the queen because they didn't realize uh, there's a valve fold which kind of blocks passage of semen into the oviducts. So they would set up several instruments and they would seminate these queens like once an hour for like over 10 or 12 hours. So you can imagine these poor queens. Um, we didn't have a method to anesthetize them so they're wiggling around and uh, very clumsy system here, but um, this is a picture out of the, one of the bee journals in, in the 1930s, I think. So they would just set all these queens up, lots of different instruments, and then just inseminate them and come back. And it looked like maybe there was something going in there properly, but they, they just weren't sure. So pretty interesting. Um, Harry Laidlaw described, he was, a, he was a grad student at the time, and he, he dissected the queen and looked at the physiology, and he, he found the valve fold. Um, this is a little uh, flap of invaginated tissue that blocks passage. The queen has control of this when she mates. So um, he really, that, this, this really revolutionized the technique. If, now we know that you can actually deliver the semen into the oviduct if you can bypass the valve fold. So that would really uh, advance the technique quite a bit. He made, his, uh, he made an instrument. Um, which you can see here, where you have two hooks to open the, the, ca the vaginal cavity and the, uh, the syringe tip is placed in there. And there's some more. And, also, and at the time they weren't, there's some um, reference in the literature of using um, ether to inseminate a queen, to, to anesthetize the queen during this process so she wouldn't be wiggling around so much. And they said it had abnormal effects. I'm not sure what that means, but it obviously wasn't uh, beneficial to the queen. Well, they were um, gassing mosquitoes in the lab, and uh, Mackinson noticed this and said, oh, well, maybe we can use that for queens. So he tried uh, giving CO2 treatments to the virgin queens before insemination and found that this actually made them start laying faster. We know now that the CO2 affects the uh, juvenile hormone, which kicks in all the, the initiates, induces the egg-laying, induces the ovary development. So this is really important and a big advantage. Uh, so it solved the problem of that slow, delayed egg-laying. This is one of the first instruments uh, coming out of Germany. It's kind of the, the basis for the Mackinson, which most instruments d uh, are still designed today. You have your uh, your little queen holder here. This goes to a line of, of carbon dioxide, CO2, set of hooks, and your syringe. Uh, this is the Mackinson. This is 1950, 60s, 70s. This was in use. Um, Mackinson made a plastic tip. He, he reamed these out in the center. These are pretty difficult to make. Um, and you can fit enough um, semen in there for one queen. You could get 10 to 12 microliters in each of these tips. So you would do a queen one, one at a time. Um, again, you have the little uh, plastic tubing here to hold the queen, uh, a line of carbon dioxide, two sets of hooks. 
Um, if you look at the, the equipment, it seems like several different countries have their own instruments. There's a lot of diversity. There's not a lot of standardization in this technique. Um, and there's not enough, hasn't been enough demand for the instruments to really mass produce them like we do with uh, other beekeeping equipment. So it's been kind of a lot of variable. A lot of times, uh, I teach this, a lot of people bring instruments of, from all different places and a lot of the pieces are not compatible. So if you're looking to get into this, research the equipment a little bit. Um, this is a, the German instrument has become the most common one today, that you have the really fine German machining. This is the, the Schley. Um, and you've got a micro manipulated syringe, which is a little bit different now. And uh, different type of sting hooks, I'll go through those. But basically what you need is a, the basic instrument, you need really fine precision and movements. You want really fine control of those movements because look at the distance you're going in. You're working with a tiny little insect. Um, you need a, a microscope. Simple dis dissecting microscope is fine. Um, a, a source of light, you want a cool light like an LED or fiber optic light works and a source of uh, carbon dioxide. But most of all you need some beekeep beekeeping experience. Working with virgin queens and drones are not really normal for most beekeepers, even with the queen producers. Um, there's a bit of training I have to do to get them to understand what I need for that whole process. Um, virgin queens are, if you've ever worked with them very much, they're very runny, uh, you know, you open the hive and they're in the air. Um, if you, as soon as they're mature, four or five days old, they're very scampy like that. The same with the drones. The drones are, um, they're very vulnerable to any kind of stressors. And, and when the colony is stressed, it puts this energy into uh, younger, rearing another batch of drones or kicking out the old drones. So it, it's a bit of a, uh, takes a little bit of work to do that, get it all together. Lots of choices today, as I mentioned. These are kind of the major ones available. Um, the, the German Schley instrument. Uh, Sventi from Denmark makes this one. This, is, this one has a, kind of a joystick type of manipulations uh, on the um, handles. And it, it, it's in a, a solid plane. I, I like to swing my syringe forward and backward and have more flexibility in there. So it kind of depends what you like. This is one from Poland kind of a takeoff again of that, that basic Mackinson design. Um, he's got a long handled uh, syringe manipulator on here for better ease of moving the syringe around that works in the back of the instrument. So a lot of this is uh, kind of feel or it's very personal. Even the adjustments on the instrument can be very personal. Some people like them tight or loose or it, it's what you kind of get used to. Um, so again, in your instrument choice, just take a little care. Um, this is the Harbo large capacity syringe. Um, I, I like to pair this with the Schley. It's um, the, the German or the, the European type of instruments usually have, they've, we've moved completely to glass tips. Um, some of these have a capacity of about 50 microliters or you can get a, there's a capillary tube. I'll show you in the next slide on this one. But this syringe is very fragile. You have a long, glass needle made out of a capillary tube, very, very um, fragile if you bump it or something. And um, the problem sometimes if you get a mucus plug in the end of that, it's very difficult to remove without losing your, your semen that you've collected. And um, the semen collection process is very tedious. So when you collect it, you don't want to waste any or lose any. You'll see a little bit of that. Um, these are some simplified instruments. Um, Tilly Kuhnert and Laidlaw developed this simplified instrument thinking they could, this is something the beekeeper can make in the shop and it might encourage more beekeepers to use it if they didn't have to buy an expensive instrument. Kind of a mechanical takeoff on this is the Latchaw instrument. This has been modified uh, several times, um, but it uses a, a, a dial here to move the syringe up and down and then you can swing it to the side. So a little different feel. There's no, there's no uh, ventral hook here. You use a pair of uh, forceps to lift the sting, which is basically what Watson started with early on. So a little bit of different feel to that one as well. 
Um, here you can see them using the forceps to you grab, you grab, basically grab the sting and pull it. I've got some better pictures in more detail here. S type of syringes, again, you, you've got the, um, the basic Mackinson type syringe. It's got a little plunger in here and the, the plastic tip. I don't know if these, you can even find these anymore. Most of us have gone to using the glass tips. They're easier to make, um, much cheaper. You can make them all different size finishes. Uh, for example, you can put a, um, a flat finish or you can put an angled finish on there. You can make them different sizes. Some of the different subspecies, you'll use different size tips. Um, I like an angled tip. It gives you a little bit of a leading edge and also a, um, a more surface area to collect the semen. So these are just the, the different. This is the, uh, with the Harbo syringe. The tip is short. You can see here as compared to the, the European style and it has a capillary tube inside. So basically, you and it's connected with these two little pieces of latex. So essentially, you could just fill up that capillary tube, change it out, and fill up another one. So it's kind of an endless uh, quantity of semen you can collect in this. This was designed for um, semen storage by John Harbo in the US. Um, and kind of the nice thing about it, it's got a separate stand, so you have a little dial here, and you can very um, accurately calculate the amount of semen you want to give. For example, if you collect the full tube of semen, you can um, measure that out in, in uh, a micrometer or less, uh, a microliter or less, depending on what you're doing. One turn of that is about 10 microliters. That's about the, the dosage you're going to give a queen. Um, and then you can take this out and, and store it. Um, I plug it with a little bit of uh, petrolatum. Vaseline, basically. The Germans have a little uh, glass tip they connect with a little piece of uh, silicon tubing to close it. Um, doesn't really matter. The, the main thing is if you're collecting large quantities of semen like this, you want to make sure it's, it's, you have very sterile conditions, very clean conditions, because the drones, they, they tend to defecate when, during the uh, immersion process. I'll talk about that a little bit later. But um, that, that's the main drawback. One of the hardest things, I think, to get across to people. Um, the drones are, it, you don't realize how precious and how much pampering these guys take. <laughs> yeah, as uh, David Tarpey mentioned, talking about nutrition, you have to have a colony that's really healthy, good nutrition, strong. And it's a seasonal thing. Drones are seasonally produced. so. If it's swarm season, you've got a lot of resources coming in, the colonies are building up, it, it seems like drones are easy to produce. But you push that a little bit later in the season, it, it can become quite a challenge. Uh, older queens tend, a uh, colony headed by an older queen, a year old queen, they tend to favor the drones or hold them longer or treat them better versus a, a new young queen. Um, if you're really desperate and really trying to push, push the drones, keep them alive, I'll just dequeen the colony. Um, and throw a queen cell in there, and usually that'll give me two weeks until she mates. And uh, the drones mature two weeks after emergence. The peak maturity is really about three weeks. You'll get a much easier to collect, nicer semen load out of a three-week-old drone than you will out of a two-week-old drone in general. All these are kind of seasonal, too. Um, Again, that these, these guys, you can almost, we've got the queen rearing down. We know how to do that. We can push that early or late, but it's really about the drones. To get a large number of drones from the, the, the select colonies you want those from and take them to maturity and have them available. Once you take these guys out of the colony, you've got maybe 40 minutes. They lose energy and they get cool, they get a little chilly. You can do things like, uh, you could take a little box of bees with a screen on it. I usually put that in my flight box, um, make sure they're well fed, and when the drones fall down and get tired, the bees will feed them, and then you can work with them again. I usually have a light to keep them warm. Um, they just, once you take them out of the colony, they just need to be taken care of. Uh, we use these uh, plastic drone combs uh, I usually put those almost in the center of the brood nest as soon as the hint of spring comes. I want them to jump on those as, as soon as possible. Um, just take care with your drones. They're, 
they're really the challenge in all this. I, I collect the drones in these little drone cages. They're made of queen excluder material. I make them like that. I want the worker bees to go in there and attend them. When you cage drones, they, um, the bees are always going to favor their own drones over those. They're going to favor younger drones over these drones. So these are going to be the last to be taken care of. I usually put those in my cell boulder, virgin bank, some place where they'll have more, they'll be better taken care of in general. Um, this is a, just a flight box. I'll put a couple of these. I'll take one cage of these from each of my breeder yards, mix those three cages or whatever in my box there and just randomly pick the drones uh, out of here. These drones are caught, uh, easy way to catch them is just put a queen excluder up against the entrance during flight time. The drone flight time, you have to watch that. You have to figure out when that is. Um, it'll change during the season, it'll change during the weather conditions. Um, usually they start about one in the afternoon and as the season gets later and, and it gets hotter, like in California, late in the season when we're having really hot weather, they would fly about six, seven at night. Um, you have to watch for, you just kind of see when that peak flight is. Depends again on the season, weather conditions. There may be some differences between the subspecies as well. Um, I'll leave them, I'll, I'll, I'll put them in these cages and hold them, hopefully not more than overnight, uh, sometimes a couple of days, but they also build up a lot of uh, feces and that can be really messy. There's also methods where you can, you can put them between, uh, in a colony between excluders. Um, I like my drones to fly. And usually what I'm doing is I, I, and keep in mind that drones, they drift incredibly between, if you have, between colonies within the apiary. Some colonies are gonna be more friendly than other ones as far as trying to take care of them and tolerate them, feed them. So uh, just, if, if you mark drones, you'll see that huge variation where they go. If you want something very specific, um, I find the easiest way to do that is when the, you have the newly emerged fuzzy little drones, I just take one of those uh, paint pens and mark a whole bunch. But note, your recovery is probably maybe 30%. Um, you lose a lot. You have a high rate of attrition with drones. So always plan on having more than you can possibly need. Okay, at this stage, when you're, I have my nice box of mature drones, um, and you're, you're popping these for insemination, if it's a good day, half of those drones will yield usable semen, half. There's some that are going to be so mature they just explode. Some will just not yield. Uh, some end up on your finger or contaminated. Uh, usually the first thing the drones do is defecate, so you have to take uh, a lot of care with that. You're, you're going to discard a lot just for that reason as well. It's all about the drones, mostly. Um, this is a this is a drone. The the process to expose the semen it, it's kind of a two step two step process. You have the partial aversion and the full aversion. Um, at this stage, um, these cornea they have kind of an orangey yellow color when they're mature. It's an indication it's mature. Um, and then the full aversion you have the the endophallus, and the semen is kind of a creamy coffee au lait color. Uh, okay, here's the. Here's the partial version. You notice the color, kind of that orangey yellow. Um, and then this is the fuller version. And the semen is kind of this creamy, marbly. You want to see some marbly kind of. Underneath this is, is a bed of mucus. The semen sits on the bed of mucus. The, the mucus is much more viscous. It's much more sticky. Um, and the semen, you, the, you, the job is to just skim that little bit of semen off of the, the endophallus. OK, so this drone is immature. You have no color, and there's no semen. I'm going to go back here a minute. Um, so at this stage, usually, usually you, can, you, you can acquire this stage by just grabbing a mature drone or crushing the thorax if, it's, if you want to stimulate a little bit. And then it actually turns inside out. So you want to roll, you want to start at the very base and just roll your fingers along the side of the drone. 
So what I do is I, I put my hand in the cage, and I grab the drone by the, the thorax, crush him, and I, I'm, you're, you're testing, is this one going to be mature? Is this one going to be, um, can I probably yield a good semen load? And you want to do that quickly because you want to go through these f as fast as you can because it is a tedious process. Okay, so I have the partial version. Then I'll, I'll take my hand, this, these two fingers, and just start at the very base of the thorax and roll my fingers forward to push out that full endophallus. And then, and that's what you see here. So you can practice this. This is a nice little test to, you know, if you're mating queens in the area, are the, mature, are the drones mature yet? What are the semen loads look like? So it's, it's a valuable little test to do as well. Um, again, immature drones. Um, the semen collection, as I mentioned, this is very tedious. Um, I like to give them 10 to 12 microliters. The, the normal dose is anywhere between eight, eight to 12. Usually one dose of eight to 12. You, the sm we know that the smaller doses migrate faster. You could give them two doses of three or four also and get an equivalent, but it seems like the extra handling of that is not really um, it's just extra work, extra stress on the queen. Um, and it's, uh, it's more, I think, what's more important than that is the care that queen gets after the procedure. Is really, and I'll talk about that a little bit more too. So um, here's a syringe. You want to make sure you have an air space. The, the, the syringe is uh, it's filled with a saline solution, so it's basically a liquid plunger. You want to have a little air space between the saline and the semen so this doesn't mix, otherwise you're just going to get this kind of milky, um, and you won't be able to measure how much semen is there. The semen can be, um, here the semen's a nice tight little clump, here it's a little bit more spread out. Um, the younger drones will have kind of a thinner, a thinner layer, a little more difficult, it mixes more easy with the mucus. Um, the older drones tend to have a, a, more of a clump that's a little darker. But you can see it, it takes a little practice. Um, the mucus is very viscous. If you get into that layer, it'll plug the tip, it'll plug the queen, and it'll just uh, be very annoying. So you have to learn how to just skim that semen off the, off the, off the mucus layer. And it's, it's much more fluid. It, it just, you kind of make, con just make contact and pull it away, and you can skim that much more lightly. Uh, semen collection problems. This is a pretty common thing that happens. He's uh, flipped back and touched his body. It, I, so this would, I would consider contaminated, would not use it. You want to be really careful with contamination, especially if you're collecting large quantities. You get a little bit of contamination in there and that can ruin the whole batch of queens. So you want to take care with that. Uh, mucus, if you get a little resistance, um, it's, it, you'll, you'll get that sticky, mucus in there. So you want to make sure you don't get that in the tip. And if you get a little bit in the tip, get rid of that as soon as you can. Try to push it out because it's, it tends to gel more and become more of a problem uh, later. Um, positioning the queen, the, the position of that queen, how you open her is going to make a big difference in the ease or the difficulty of that insemination. Um, there's, there's several different types of hooks. The, this ventral hook is uh, simply a, to stabilize her. Mostly you're working with the, the sting hook side. This is a perforated hook there's a, it, where the th sting is threaded. We'll go through these different hooks. But there's a... Um, uh, let's see, it's the next slide, bypassing the valve fold. Okay, here's the valve fold. It's a, a little flap of tissue here. Um, with a syringe, you want, you want to come down behind it. If you, if you sit on top of that, the semen's going to backflow. And th this is going to be a little different. Every queen's going to be different, like all of us are different. So there's a little, you have to kind of feel that. Um, so you come down behind it, you push up a little bit. So it's, it's kind of like a zigzag. You come down, push up a little bit, and go a little bit deeper. So you're putting that right in the lateral ovary duct, which are big stretchy uh, organs that can hold a lot of uh, the volume of semen. And that'll take about 40, 48 hours to migrate into the spermatheca. So it's pretty black and white. It'll, it'll either go in or not. 
Um, and you can, it's, you, it just takes a little practice to get a feel for, for how to do this. Um, these are different type of sting hooks. This is a classic sting hook. It's kind of a spoon shape. This is what um, we started out with the 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, and you've got this large sting structure that has to be lifted out of the way. And it's more lifting up. If you push down underneath this, there's a, a poison sac. So you don't want that. Sometimes if you put pressure on that, you get a little drop of venom coming out on the end of the sting. So you want to take a little care with that. Um, this is the perforated sting hook. It has a hole in it in which the sting is threaded. Again, you can see that large sting structure that has to be lifted up. And the, the tendency is to open it, the, the, use the two hooks like this. It's really you stabilize the ventral hook and then you work with the sting hook, lifting that over. And you kind of follow that angle, um, which will make it much easier. This is a, um, I work with a hobby beekeeper. He was a jeweler by trade. He made this um, ruby jewel sting hook. With a little, it's, got, it's a piece of, well, I guess they use it in watchmaking, these uh, little rubies with holes in it. So that was just kind of a novelty, kind of pretty fun. But, um, and the other, the other, another choice is the, um, the forceps hook. This, this you use uh, to grab the tip of the sting and, and pull it over. This seems, when you first try this one, it seems very big and invasive. But once you get, if you have a light touch using it, it's uh, much more efficient, much faster. You can get in and out really quick. And you want to be, use the queens under there just for uh, 20, 30 seconds. It goes really quick once you just learn how to get past the valve fold. And you want to minimize the time she's under like that as well, just less injury infection. Um, this is the handheld forceps. Again, it's, it's the same kind of concept. You just grab the sting. Um, let me go back to this one a minute. Usually when you're first learning this, a lot of people end up pulling the sting out. That's okay. The first, I mean, just the first time you try this, it's going to feel brutal and awkward and you're going to kill a lot of queens, but that's kind of part of the learning process. So the message is just, it's okay. Just make sure um, you have some material to work with like that. So forceps hook, again, the you just pull it up, and this is like a, it's kind of like the, you know, a, a pen or pencil where you have that kind of hooked on thing. That's, it's just stable. It hooks, it hooks onto the, the queen holding tube, so there's not much manipulation. You can't manipulate that very much. You can't open it really wide. It just stabilizes it. So that kind of forces you into that. Uh, Spermatheca, again, here's the, the mated queen, um, the virgin, and the poorly mated queen. If you, if, you, if you dissect out the spermathecas of those queens within the, a few hours of insemination, you'll see this. You'll see a little bit of uh, milkiness in there. But if you, if, if you're, when you're first learning this, bank the queens in a, a, a queenless nursery colony for about two days. One, are they still alive? Are they vigorous? You'll look, you're looking for infection or something like that, injury, and the queens will get lethargic or die. So you'll, that'll be one heads up. Um, and then dissect out the spermathecas, and then you, you can tell how well mated she is and keep some records. Um, but you want to see that marbling. Um, this, is, this is the inside of the spermatheca. These the sperm have really long tails, they're, and they're bundled very tightly. She's got some accessory glands supplying nutrients, and you've got that tracheal net let me go back to that tracheal net. You've got the, this is a tracheal net surrounding the, the sperm. I think if you just kind of roll it in your fingers, that'll fall away. Um, let's see. Okay, this is a quick little field dissection of the spermatheca. Uh, if you're, when you're requeening, getting rid of queens, or if you want to see how well your queens did uh, when you're first learning this technique, if you just grab the last two segments um, and just pull. It seems a bit crude, but you can look in here and you can see there's a little round ball. Again, here's the, the spermatheca. It looks rough. 
It looks, these are just my fingernails. These are, you can do this with a pair of forceps too if you want. But this is just a, a quick field dissection. You can see the, the spermatheca. It's very round. The, um, the poison sac is clear, doesn't have much, it has no color. <coughs> Um, so it'll look kind of rough like this. This still has the tracheal net covering. I can't tell, is she mated? Is this, is this mated or is it a virgin? You got that tracheal net covering. Um, and then you just roll that in your fingers and push it away. So um, again, that, the, the, the queen's language is her pheromone. The young queens will have a higher levels of turgo gland pheromones. This is kind of a signal that she's ready to mate. I'm, I'm receptive. Um, and the mandibular glands will develop more after, the, after she's um, a, a full queen, after she's mated and communicate that. So it's a signal to the colony. That's really important in her acceptance. This, the, this change, there's a big, if you just look at the physiology, the pheromone, if you go from a virgin to a mated queen, there's a lot going on here. These queens are kind of slower to make those changes, so they can be more difficult to introduce. You want to take a little bit more time with the queen introductions with these. Uh, I always start them in, in maybe a five frame nucleus, not anything larger than a single deep. Um, lots of young nurse bees. Young nurse bees are good, but will take better care of her, and they're also going to be less um, aggressive compared to field bees when you're trying to introduce them. Um, I like to use a um, a push-in cage. This is a little piece of screen you put over the queen, over a, usually put it over a patch of emerging brood or a few with a young nurse bees in there with her. If I have the time, I'll have that, um, I'll just do a direct release. I'll have that virgin caged in the mating nook and just after insemination, just put a little candy plug there and, and release her. Or I'll take a spray bottle with uh, a scent, like uh, Honey Bee Healthy, lemongrass type of scent. Spray all the bees, spray the queen, and by the time they clean up, um, everybody seems to be sharing that, that pheromone or it's a distraction or something. They're much easier to introduce like that. Um, I always put a piece of queen excluder over the entrance until I see eggs. She can have just three eggs, but I want to see eggs before I take this off. Um, they will take they will attempt to take another mating flight. Um, the CO, we know that the CO2 treatments will inhibit them. You want to give them two treatments. I didn't say that. They need two CO2 treatments. I usually give one treatment the day before insemination, and then the second treatment is during the procedure. And that kicks in all these different um, egg development, physiological differences. So, And that, that'll start the queen laying much faster. I used to give her the second treatment after the procedure, but keep in mind that that sperm is migrating. You have about 40, 48 hours for the sperm to migrate. I don't want to interrupt that, and I don't want to interrupt the bees and her introduction, so it's much easier to give her that CO2 the day before, and it's also more beneficial in getting her to start laying sooner. So that's really key. Um, if you can, really the treatment of these queens, you hear a lot of people say that they're, they're very difficult to introduce. It's just taking a little bit more care with them. If you can put them, establish that queen, I, I, put, I always cage the virgins in a cage and leave her in a, a mating nuke. And then after insemination, try to do a direct release. So she's, the more active she is, the better that sperm will migrate. So that's really important for her. And the bees, she'll get more attention from the worker bees rather than leaving her in a bank caged with many queens. So, uh, and we know this has a big effect on performance. Did I see all those things? Um, the age is very important for insemination. If you look at when queens take their mating flights, they're about a week old. Um, there's some studies showing if, if you, if the queen, if the weather's really bad and she hasn't, she hasn't mated for like two, three weeks, they store less sperm, mate with, fewer drones, things like that. The same thing applies here. If you hold those queens in a bank for a month or six weeks or whatever, you're going to have poor, poor quality or less sperm migration. Um, and the bees really, um, once she's of age, they, they chase her around the colony. They want her to go out and take a mating flight, you know, so they, they have a sense of all those things. Um, 
This is a study I did. It's just a review of different studies looking at the performance of instrumental salmonid queens and natural mated queens. And I'll, I know this is hard to read. I can explain it real quick in a, in a, a few sentences. But it's, um, it it's really looks at the, uh, well, OK. These studies, these are the authors of the studies. They go back to 1946, I think, until the, to, uh, till almost the present. And they're looking at this. The yellow is instrumental inseminated queens. The blue is naturally mated queens. And we're looking at, uh, this is the number of queens in the studies, honey production, brood production, longevity, and I'll get to this in a second. So in this batch of studies, they said the uh, inseminated queens and natural mated queens had equal performance. In this batch of studies, they said that the inseminated queens had higher performance. And this is mostly based on the crosses and, and selection, being able to control the mating. Um, in this study, they said the natural mated queens had higher performance. OK, so now I'm going to look at the treatment of queens. Um, the age of insemination, in, in, and I'm going to lump these two groups together and compare it to this study. So the age of these queens, they're from five to 10 days at time of, of they were inseminated. These are the instrumental inseminated queens. These queens in this study were two or three weeks old. They're past their prime, the prime age for natural mating. So that's one disadvantage. Uh, if you look at the semen dosage, these queens were all given 8 to 12 microliters, whereas in this study, they were given two doses of about 3 microliters. So they're giving small, smaller doses of semen. Um, and then if you look at the introductions, I'm again, I'm going to lump these together. These queens were DR direct. This is a direct release. The queens were directly released after insemination. Or some of these were banked for 5 to 10 days. A little bit of a disadvantage. Um, but the queens in this study, they were banked for an additional two or three weeks after insemination. So these queens never saw comb or were isolated in cages for four to six weeks. That's the difference between the performance of these and these queens. So the care you give these queens is really essential. It's really important if you're going to do this. Um, set your virgins in a, a mating nook and give them a, a direct as direct as possible introduction as you can so that she can move around after, after the insemination. The sperm will migrate more efficiently. Um, she's got more access to the bees to be fed, taken care of. Uh, she's fed roll jelly her whole life. You don't want to have to beg through a little cage. Um, I've banked queens and inseminated them out of the bank uh, lots of times. You get busy, you get backed up, and, and they do, they do OK. But you just want to try to optimize every step of the process as best you can. You know, if you just look at the process of queen rearing, you have that whole series of things that you do. And you want to just optimize these in the same way. Um, what else have I had here? Again, this is, a, this is a fairly technical skill. It takes a bit of practice. My recommendation is to make a bank of 30, 50 virgins, <coughs> inseminate those, put them in the bank, leave them there for a couple of days, and then look at the spermathecus, look at your results. Um, chances are the first couple batches, you may have really high mortality. You know, go back and look at your sanitation. That's one of the hardest things to get across to people, mostly because the drones are so messy. Um, I wear latex gloves, and I have a towel soaked in alcohol that I'm constantly uh, wiping my hands with. Um, but at the same time, you can get amazing results. When, when you have control over the mating, you can just get really amazing results. Uh, we talked a lot about genetic diversity, breeding programs. Decide what you want to do with this and go as far as you can with your breeding program before you get into this. Know what you want out of it. It's an amazing research tool. But it, it's not something everyone needs. Um, to do it on a large scale is pretty labor intensive, pretty expensive. The instruments roughly are about $1,500, $2,000 to get set up. You need a, a dissecting microscope, a light, CO2. Um, you need to get used to or learn some 
skills with banking virgins and drones, caring for drones, the drones are really the most challenging part of this. And that's something we don't give enough credit to or don't pay enough attention to as beekeepers. The drones are always kind of just there or not there. Um, you, each one of these you want to optimize as best you can. Um, semen storage, we can, we can hold this stuff for about two weeks at room temperature. I've traveled with it, with it quite a bit and I just put the capillary tubes in a, a little wooden bed that, that keeps it very secure. Um, I've had people <laughs> arrive at the airport and put these in the, the dash of the car and cook it. I've had people arrive in the mail and throw it in the refrigerator. Um, it, this is, you're going to get some major damage with that, that kind of thing. Um, keep it away from the sun. Sunlight, I usually just put it in a, a drawer in a, a cool room. You want to keep it about 58, 59 degrees, well, 14 degrees centigrade. Um, and again, the, the longer you hold it, the more risky it is, the more time bacteria has to grow in there. So don't hold it just because you can. Hold it because you have to or need to or traveling with it. My, my routine is I, I like to catch the drones in the afternoon, um, collect semen, and then do the queens in the next morning. Uh, or collect the drones and you know do the queens. It, it doesn't really matter, but it gives you a little time to schedule things if you want to. Um, semen mixing, again, these, uh, uh, David Tarpey mentioned this briefly. These tails are really long and, and the, they're tightly coiled. The sperm likes to be really tightly coiled together. T to mix it, to really mix it, you have to kind of dilute it and then reconstitute it. And in that process, you, lose, you can lose, uh, there's techniques to centrifuge it. You lose some of the components of the uh, seminal plasma that are really essential. We can, uh, you can expel it and recollect it, and that's a nice way to uh, mix it, but you need to dilute it a little bit, maybe 15%, and you get fairly good mixing with that. Uh, the type of diluents, the type of saline you're using with that, um, it, that it's, a, it's, that seminal fluid is pretty complex. You want to, I've used uh, just really simple saline to some, uh, Brandon Hopkins, who's doing the cryopreservation, he's got this really fancy formula for the, for the cryopreservation of sperm. It's got amino acids and all kinds of different things in there, so he makes that up for me now. Antibiotics and um, some sugars in there. Um, just, I guess the, the main message is to make sure you have, it, it use really clean water, filtered water, distilled water. Um, there's some formulas. I have a, um, uh, chapter in the Coloss book. Are you guys familiar with that? And that, that book, it's online, I think, for free. There's some uh, formulas in there. Uh, there's some formulas on my, um, on my website. I have copies of that you can look at for free. There's also some um, little one-page diagrams like it, uh, Ever in the Endophallus and Semi the Queen, Spermatheca dissection, little things like that you can uh, download. <laughs> Uh, let's see what else is in here. Long-term storage. This is really getting excited. I mentioned this earlier. The ability to cryopreserve semen. Uh, we're much closer to it. It's not perfect. The, the queens inseminated with that cryopreserved semen, are, they're, it's not going to be a strong colony. There is some damage to the sperm. There is a percentage that of, of non-viable, uh, non-fertile sperm. But it's enough to recover it. So usually what I do from that, I'll, I'll, I'll rear daughters off of that if it's something really special. Uh, as I mentioned, when we're bringing in germplasm from other countries, we put some in the liquid nitrogen tank, and then that gives me an opportunity to make future, future generations of it. So uh, this is uh, Brandon's process. Uh, he puts them in these little, little straws, five microliters at a time. Um, and it's all computer controlled, timed, how, how the temperature goes down. Um, and this is the, the liquid nitrogen container to take it down. Um, and then, then we, uh, insem we thaw it out, inseminate the queens, and get her established in a colony. And that can just give you, uh, you, can, you can do amazing things with this. You, you can uh, 
in six generations, you could reconstruct a subspecies. For example, we reestablished um, Caucasian queens, and I, all I had was carniolans to backcross them to. So after six generations, I can have something that's fairly, fairly pure, um, just like backcrossing these over a couple of generations. And you can do several generations in a season, which is kind of exciting. Um, as I mentioned before, the, one of the missions of the, the Department of our Department of Agriculture is to add honeybees to their ger germplasm repositories, and also Apamondi is looking at several universities across Europe to try to set up um, repositories for honeybee germplasm, which is really exciting. You know, with the worldwide movement of bees and the worldwide movement of all their pests and pathogens. Um, a lot of different types of uh, ecotypes of bees or sub some of the subspecies may be under a lot of pressure. So it's really important to maintain though. Your mellifera, mellifera honeybees is one. Um, a lot of advantages with this, this basic technique. You can just, you can store those top tier best of your breeding stock and, and pull that out in future generations. You can, you can breed across time which is a pretty amazing. Um, you, can, you can look at, um, it, it's just much more cost effective. If you look at the cost of maintaining a breeding population and doing a, a, a generation every year just to keep it going, and, and all that is flexible, dynamic, constantly changing. But if you can just stick it in a, a, t a tank of liquid nitrogen, that's gonna save a lot on cost and labor. Uh, and if you look at most of the advances made in agriculture, domesticating animals, plants, a lot of it has to do with being able to have this kind of technology. So it's, it's pretty exciting. Um, a lot of research advantages at this as well. Just the conservation of these different threatened species. You can apply, say you find some marker uh, that identifies whatever it is in the bee, some varroa, resistance or any kind of trait like that. You could kind of preserve that and bring it out at future generations to work with. Um, as I mentioned, reconstruct uh, subspecies like we've done with the Caucasian bees. And j just a lot of things. This is common for cattle and pigs and horses. And, and we finally have this capability now for the honeybees. So I think it's, uh, I think it is really kind of, a, we've been through a lot of big challenges with all the pests and diseases and all this stuff. but. I think the future, the direction we're going with honeybee breeding, the technologies we have now, is really going to take off with, with bee breeding. So I, I'm really optimistic about um, where this is going to go. Yeah, I think it's going to be a really fun um, process. So I, you know, I realize most of you probably will never get into this, but just having an appreciation of it, um, and if you, if you are learning it, it's, it's about persistence. It's not so easy to learn. You know, you'll, you'll take a few stumbles the first time you try it. It feels awkward and, um, but it's a very powerful tool, very powerful tool. So thank you. And thank you to our sponsor, Northern Bee Books. Um, and if you want some more information, if you Google honeybeeinsemination.com, or even if you Google my name, there's some just free downloads there, some publications if you want information on formulas for saline solution. You got a question about this whole process, just shoot me an email and I'll, I'll, I'll help you the best I can. Um, but it, it's just really uh, an amazing tool. You can do really, really cool things with this. So, and again, thank you guys. This has been a really fun convention. Um, really fun to see some old friends here and be back in this country, so thank you. Have you done any black back breeding? Because we talk about the old black English bee and nobody's got oh, them. Oh, have I ever worked with Melissa Yeah, have you, have you ever managed to uh, get them? No, I haven't. I haven't. Um, but I... It's a, it's a large bee, isn't it? It's more like a carniolan, isn't it? Or is it smaller? Um, it is actually slightly larger. Mm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you look, there's a lot of differences between the subspecies. I'll, I'll just, I'll tell you what I know. If you look at an Italian, she's kind of plump, round. A lot more working space in there. 
I hope this isn't too graphic. Uh, the, if you look at a carnial and she's more long, kind of tapered, a little bit tighter working space in there. The Caucasians are even tighter than that. I had to change my, uh, I w when I first tried those, I was kind of frustrated, so I used a, a finer tip. So there's going to be variations in the, the size of the oviduct opening between these subspecies. No one's ever really measured this. That's something I'd kind of like to do or see or uh, hopefully we can do that soon. Um, yeah, so uh, the size of the tip can make a big difference. Um, does that answer your question a little bit? I, I don't, I haven't tried mellifera mellifera. I would like to. Michael, you must have. What do you, what do you yeah, think? Okay. Yeah, I mean, you've got a larger queen, but even if you look at uh, Carnica, that's a larger queen, but the spaces, I, I did some, I tried some bumblebees, and these things were huge. We had to get a, a Eppendorf tube to, to fit her into the, because she wouldn't fit in my little queen tubes. And uh, it was incredibly tight in there for this big fat queen. I mean, she's like three times, four times the size of a honeybee queen, but the working space in there, and she, it, the valve fold, if she has one, it, it certainly, it took me a while to try to figure that out, but it felt like she had one and was way over on the far side. That's another thing, it, when you open the queen, it, it can be centered, it can be toward one side or the other, just everybody's different, so it John. applies there too. I'd just like to ask you about um, uh, semen release from spermatheca into the uh, yet, yet unfertilized egg. Mm. Um, Am I right in suspecting or thinking that it's approximately th uh, three uh, semen or sperm per egg I, in, in a drench? Uh, I know only one reaches sure a microphone. I'm not sure if anyone's ever looked at that, but I, it's, yeah. it's more than one. It's, it's a small number yeah, like three. that. I so just wondered if you had as well. I, I don't know offhand, and I, I would, my guess is that might even vary a bit. I don't know. Okay. David Tarpey, do you have an answer to that question? Yeah, How? Seven to twenty per egg. John Hubbard's work in the seventies. Wow, that's a lot. That's interesting. Okay. When a queen is uh, mated by drones in the air, mm -hmm. by twenty drones or fifteen drones, what happened with the semen of uh, number one, number ten, and number she, twenty? She collects a large amount of semen from all those drones, but she's going to expel about 90% of that. So she's taking just, it mixes in the oviducts. So she's taking a little bit from all the drones. So all those drones will be represented in the subfamilies of her colony, but it's very inefficient. It's very, I don't know if you call it wasteful, but it's another mechanism for genetic diversity. She's, the oviducts are, they're big, stretchy. She can hold quite a bit there. So about the natural um, reproduction, so what is the role of the cornice or the horn when it's natural uh, Well, they're mating in flight. So that's the way the drone anchors himself and holds on during the so immersion process. Mechanism. Yeah, because yeah. oh. that endophallus, it actually kind of turns inside out. Yeah, and then so the he's horns hold on to the queen. Yeah, there's some pouches along the in the on the sides there that he uh, holds on to that way. Thank you. And then the, 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 he's got there's some hairy parts on that endophallus that kind of kicks out the previous drone, and the 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 mating side is is very attractive. It's got some ultraviolet properties. So if she's mated and flying, that actually makes her more attractive, and the, and, and they can mate really fast, like bam, bam, bam. And you can actually hear a pop in that. If, if you're in those mating areas, it's, it's an amazing process. My husband always says that they die, but they've probably got a smile on their face. <laughs> I think you said in one of your earlier talks that um, different um, patrol lines were perhaps better at doing different jobs. Um, I was wondering if any of those patrol lines would, fa would, would, would know which their sisters were going to be in terms of when they were raising queens and raised the best queen 
Well, you there's kinship favoritism in the hive. Did, so do they all do that? Uh, they all want to try and get their sisters to be the queens. I don't think it's quite that. Um, David Tarpey, can you answer that question? <laughs> <laughs> what? No nepotism. I thought there was kinship studies showing that they were related. No? No nepotism. Whoa, that's interesting. So it's fairly random. Huh, interesting. Okay, thank you.